A Pakistan International Airlines plane with over 100 people on board crashes near Karachi Airport in a residential area. The plane was flying from Lahore to Jinnah International Airport, which is Pakistan's busiest. China proposes a new law to ban sedition, treason and subversion in Hong Kong. Move angers pro-democracy protesters and is likely to spark unrest. Union Health Minister Harshwardhan takes charge as the chairman of the 34-member WHO Executive Board says strengthening of global partnerships and a shared response is needed to deal with the current crisis. China agrees to a probe into the source of the COVID-19 pandemic. India had backed a call by 100 countries to look into the source of COVID-19 and the World Health Organization's response. Hello and welcome to CNBC TV 18. I'm Parikshit Lutra and you're watching The Global Eye. Our focus today is on Indo-Nepal ties, which are under strain. This after Defence Minister Rajnath Singh inaugurated an 80-kilometre road in Uttarakhand, which passes through Lipo Lake Pass. The move angered Nepal, which considers Lipo Lake as its own territory. Border tensions have been simmering ever since India released its new map after reorganisation of Jammu and Kashmir, which showed Kalapani and Lipo Lake as part of India. Nepal has now retaliated with its own political map, showing Lipo Lake, Kalapani and Limpia Dura as its own territory. Prime Minister K.P. Oli has vowed to take back these areas from India at all costs. And in his speech in Nepal's parliament, he also blamed Indian nationals for bringing the coronavirus into Nepal, saying the Indian virus is worse than China's. We spoke to Nepal's former foreign minister, Prakash Sharan Mahat. Let's listen in to what he had to say. We don't uh, uh, agree with the language, but uh, as far as uh, uh, the style is concerned regarding this land, Kalapani area, um, uh, Nepal uh, is, uh, whether we are in opposition party, whether uh, the ruling party, they are all together. We should use uh, the diplomatic language, no doubt about that. Uh, there is no other way out. Only through dialogue, only through, uh, through diplomatic uh, discussion, this can be resolved. Uh, let us put uh, evidences of both sides together and a um, uh, table. Uh, so, but based on the evidence, uh, we should agree uh, what is the reality. All right, joining me now to take the discussion forward, Constantino Xavier, Senior Fellow at Brookings India, and Rakesh Sood, former Indian Ambassador to Nepal. Many thanks for joining us on CNBC TV 18. Constantino, if I can begin with you, is this a case of pushing Nepal too much? Um, I think it's a case of an escalation that is going on uh, every hour, every day, uh, that is becoming unsustainable uh, and has many reasons. I think it's easy to point uh, fingers at uh, India, which is happening in Kathmandu these days. It's easy to point fingers at Nepal, which is happening here this side. It's easy to point fingers at China. The fact is that for Prime Minister Oli, um, the government of Nepal was under tremendous crisis and a tremendous stress of maybe even losing confidence. Uh, and this issue has become a lifeline for the Prime Minister of Nepal. This issue and the consequent nationalism we're seeing in Nepal today is really uh, his only way to remain in power. Uh, but at the same time, I think also uh, India has not responded in the right way. It has sent confusing signals all the way from saying that it's open to dialogue and to resolve this through diplomatic channels, and at the same time pushing it under the carpet, or as we saw in the remarks by the army chief, suggesting that Nepal is doing this at the behest of China, possibly. Hmm. Right. Uh, Ambassador Su, to get you in, from your experience, uh, do you get a sense that the kind of statements we are seeing from the Nepali leadership, the kind of statements that KP Oli made in parliament, that we would like to take control of these areas, we'll take them back at all costs, the Indian virus is worse than China or Italy's virus, uh, do you think there is a cause for concern here? Oh, certainly there is. I think what we are seeing is an escalation in rhetoric and if the idea is that these are issues that have to be resolved through dialogue, then heightened rhetoric is certainly not the route to adopt. But then, as Constantino said, um, this is not 
a new concern. The concerns have been there for uh, since the 1990s. We have, both sides have on repeated occasions said that we will deal with these through mutual dialogue, through mutual satisfaction. The concerns were heightened uh, in November when India issued its new maps after reorganization of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The Nepali authorities repeatedly asked us to convene foreign secretary level talks. Uh, these were not held for whatever reason. I would think that uh, we also needed to be a little more sensitive, even if we couldn't have talks. I know that there was a change of foreign secretary also during that time in January. But then perhaps we could have had a talk on the telephone. And after all, Kathmandu is not so far away. You know, just a day-long trip to uh, touch base. So perhaps I think we have, then of course, we have had the, uh, then we had the Trump visit in February. Then we had the coronavirus and that uh, sort of also had its impact. So, but surely we could have found time to connect, as it were, even, even if it was on a video call. And um, secondly, I think right. uh, while Prime Minister he has certainly engaged in uh, highly regrettable rhetoric, I think uh, for the mm -hmm. army chief also, it was, you know, the Indian army chief is also the honorary general of the Nepal army and vice versa. So imagine mm -hmm. that right. a general, an honorary general of the Nepal army is actually saying uh, to his to the Nepali soldiers that your government is actually a puppet of the Chinese. I mean, that's uh, not done. Okay. Right. Uh, but but keeping the rhetoric aside, uh, Constantino, what do you feel about uh, this feeling in certain quarters of the Indian government? The army chief articulated it very clearly that there is an outside source for this. But could China have a role? Or is that, too, uh, is that too much of a sweeping assumption? See, uh, China already has a role today in the politics of Nepal, as it has in many other countries, including in Europe and in the US. Uh, it has uh, done its outreach to the media. It's done its outreach to political parties. There have been news about the Chinese embassy uh, facilitating talks between various factions in the current government. We've seen all that. But one thing is to see that typical influence. India has its own influence in, in Nepal, by the way, similar influence. The other one is to prove mm. that that influence has been used against India, which may be true. We don't know from the outside. The government may have that information. But then on top of that, even if you have it, mm. to in public suggest that mm. at a moment where you actually want to mm. de-escalate is problematic. Now, there's only two options. One is this is part of a strategy of what mm. we would call nip it in the bud. Right. Let's go uh, strong and let's mm. not even open up a precedent, which is incoherent with the Ministry of mm. External Affairs statement, which is saying, yes, we will have a dialogue and a discussion. Mm. But then you have the army chief sort of saying, brushing it away mm. and saying this is an issue that doesn't have a lot of legitimacy. Or, you know, there was some miscoordination mm. uh, on the Indian side. The point, larger point is, and I'll be very realistic here, uh, right. this land is in Indian, Indian possession. I don't think anyone is under the illusion that mm. India will vacate it or leave it under any type of pressure, uh, including in Nepal, I think, despite all the right. rhetoric, I doubt that the prime minister of Nepal believes mm. that he has any chance in actually immediately reclaiming that land. But at the same time, we have to come up with okay. some type of a solution that is acceptable, a face-saving mechanism for Nepal and for India too. Right. Ambassador Sooth, how can we immediately salvage the situation? Well, I think uh, today at this, at this uh, juncture, even if we have the foreign secretary level talks, it's not going to be of any use because the two foreign secretaries are now bound by two maps, which both sides, uh, which both governments have adopted. And so both foreign secretaries will only put forward the two maps they don't have the wherewithal or they will not have the mandate to actually negotiate on it. So therefore, mm -hmm. we need to bring the temperature down, which means we need to stop engaging in this rhetoric. I think uh, the best thing to do would be to uh, have uh, a sort of a political level conversation on the phone. 
basically say that look, uh, we uh, we know we have had differences on Kalapani and on uh, there's another area called Susta, and uh, the best is that we, uh, without re taking recourse to rhetoric, as uh, previously Prime Ministers mm -hmm. of India and Nepal have agreed that uh, we wait for an opportune moment to exchange maps and to engage in a quiet dialogue. And uh, Do you think a message that, from the Prime uh, Minister, they, Prime Minister Modi, may help? Well, certainly. You know, when Prime Minister Modi had gone in 2014 to Nepal, it was mm. an incredibly successful visit. I mean, I remember mm. following it and I wrote about it and I said, I have not seen, there was, what was fantastic about it was that government, opposition, civil society, business community, every section in Nepal mm. came out positively mm. about uh, Prime Minister Modi's mm. visit. So, and we know that Prime Minister Modi is a mm. great communicator. So I'm sure if uh, mm. he um, tries to sort of build some bridges on this and calm the troubled mm. waters, he would be uh, extremely successful. Mm. Okay. Uh, Constantino, my question to you. Do you think this big brother attitude has been irking Nepal for a while now? And we now need to take a long-term uh, view on the strain in ties with Nepal? I think, I mean, the big brother times are over in South Asia. I think India has shown over the last few years that it's focused on interdependence, cooperation, connectivity. If you visit the India-Nepal border, the progress on borders, on uh, infrastructure, on road, on rail connectivity is impressive. That is a success for India's Nepal policy looking forward. Now, we've reached this point, like Ambassador Sud mentioned, of a high temperature, and an escalatory dimension, we will have to get off this, uh, 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 off this uh, track. And uh, there, I, I only see two possibilities, very frankly speaking. One is we should have already uh, have witnessed, which is if India finds time to receive the US special representative for Afghanistan, uh, like Ambassador Sud mentioned, it's puzzling to me that over many months this issue was brewing since November. Uh, it, the, India has not found the time to receive a uh, Nepali envoy or even, like Ambassador Sud mentioned, have some type of a pro forma formal talk. That is one. Now, going forward, there's only two ways. One is uh, we will continue seeing escalation, and this is very favorable to Prime Minister Oli in Nepal. He's enjoying this. He's, no, as you just saw in your former foreign minister of Nepal, you interviewed everyone. Uh, is supporting him. No one dares to speak up against this, including very pro-India favorable constituencies uh, in the Terai, for example. Uh, so that's one option. The other one, uh, mm. I would say, is to initiate some type of political signal from the prime ministers uh, or at the bureaucratic level, okay. uh, just you know, to say that something is happening. But most importantly, let me stress this, we will right. have to come up with innovative solutions for this disputed land. Both countries are managing it. Sorry, both countries are claiming it. Uh, both countries have a reputation domestically. Both countries will not give this issue up. So unless right. you want this issue to become a permanent irritant, you will have to come with some type of co-management, hmm. special rights for Nepal and for India, uh, access, so some type of sort of post-sovereign uh, 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 solution for this uh, uh, disputed land. Right. All right, innovative solutions needed. Thank you very much, Constantino and Ambassador Rakesh Sood, for joining us with that perspective. On that note, we'll take a short break here on Global Eye. But coming up, we get you an exclusive conversation with former Indian ambassador to China, Gautam Bambavale. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching Global Eye. Indian and Chinese troops have increased troop deployment in the Galwan region of Ladakh. This after recent incidents of face-off between Indian and Chinese uh, troops along the line of actual control. On the 5th of May, 250 Indian and Chinese troops clashed with each other at Pangong Lake area of Ladakh. And on the 9th of May, troops of the two countries clashed at Nakula Pass in Sikkim. Now, what do these clashes at the LAC mean? And is there a larger geopolitical meaning to it? Joining us right now is the former Indian envoy to China, Bhutan and Pakistan, uh, Gautam Bambavli. Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us. Our first question, how do you compare this to the Doklam standoff of 2017? 
Well, Parikshit, what I feel is that over the past few years, uh, infrastructure on both sides of the of the in the border areas between India and China, also communication and transportation has improved tremendously, and as a result, uh, you know the two uh, armies they patrol this area. But as a result of better infrastructure and as a result of better transportation and communication facilities, uh, there is more probability and likelihood of patrols from each side meeting each other. And this is what we are seeing over the last few years, starting as far back as 2013, but also in 2017, as you rightly said, and now again in 2020. Hmm. Uh, but do you feel this, this, uh, this some way, in a way, nullifies the gains of Wuhan and Mamlapuram? No, no I, I think there has to be a distinction drawn between uh, what the leadership of the two countries has agreed with each other, not only in Wuhan, but also in Chennai, uh, and its translation, the translation of their directives onto the ground. So I, I would say that, you know, sometimes it is ground troops, that is people, armies who are stationed in the border areas who do aggressive patrolling. And uh, therefore, there is a possibility of patrols of each side coming in close proximity with each other. And this is what we have been seeing in the summer months. But it is a result, as I said, of better infrastructure on both sides of the border and of better communication and transportation facilities. Uh, so I, th I think what needs to be done is for the leadership to once again reaffirm, and the two governments have said that, uh, the spokesman and the two foreign ministries have reiterated that they would like to have a peaceful and tranquil boundary and border between the two countries. And now it has to be translated onto the ground by the actual armed forces who are patrolling these areas. I think it can be done. Uh, there okay. needs to be but, better communication between the two sides. There needs to be better communication. But do you also feel, Ambassador, that somewhere there is a link between what is happening at the border and the geopolitical developments taking place between India and China and China and the world? India supporting that resolution uh, by 100 countries to uh, investigate the source of the coronavirus pandemic. Also, how... Uh, Two BJP MPs attended the swearing-in ceremony of the Taiwan president as well. Do you think uh, these are adding to some of the complications between India and China? No, I do not see a direct link between these geopolitical and these developments, international developments, with what's happening on the India-China border areas. Uh, but there, it is a fact that uh, the Chinese are becoming more um, aggressive in uh, their patrolling, not only in the India-China border areas, but also in uh, the South China Sea, for example. And I think the statement yesterday from the Ministry of External Affairs indicates uh, that what Chinese troops are doing is to prevent Indian um, uh, forces from doing their normal patrolling, which they have been doing over the past so many years which means that Chinese troops are changing the status quo ante. And that is something which is not good for peace and tranquility on the India-China boundary. Uh, Chinese troops should not change right. the status quo ante as it exists. Right. Ambassador, do you feel that uh, we could see more muscle flexing uh, by China? We have seen India putting in a mechanism to screen FDI coming in from China. Now there is a talk of tweaking foreign portfolio investment norms as well for uh, investment coming in from uh, Hong Kong and China. Look, as I said, Parikshit, I do not see a direct linkage between, say, strengthening our, our FDI norms for China uh, to what's happening on the boundary. Um, there's no direct linkage, uh, but I would say that uh, China's uh, greater assertiveness across the world, including in the post-COVID world, is something that we will continue to experience on the India-China boundary also or on the India-China border uh, parts. So I, I think it's, there's no direct linkage, but it's a larger geopolitical kind of development. And, and if we move aside from what's happening at the LSE, India's move to try and woo companies who want to de-risk, who want to set uh, manufacturing chains, 
alternate manufacturing chains in India. How will this go, or go down with uh, Beijing in the coming months? Look, this is something which is economic. And if there has to be, a, a, you know, a quid pro quo, or if there has to be some sort of counterbalancing, that will happen in the economic sphere. So I do not, again, see any linkage between that and the border. But um, obviously, it would be good if India could, um, you know, uh, leverage some of these changes which are taking place in a post-COVID world and get at least some, if not all, of the companies who want to produce in other parts of the world, who want to manufacture in other parts of the world. It, 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 dove, it dovetails well with our own Make in India policy. And uh, I would be very happy to see some more companies uh, investing in greenfield ventures in India. But these could include Chinese companies as well through our normal FDI channels. Hmm. Uh, what do you feel about uh, this development, the timing of this development, uh, the Chinese uh, government's decision to introduce a law to, strict, to strengthen enforcement over Hong Kong? What do you feel about the timing of this move? Um, I, I think it was on the anvil. It was uh, to be introduced at the National People's Congress meeting, which was originally scheduled for March, but which has just started today. Um, and I think that this is something which is uh, going to change the nature of Hong Kong as an international financial uh, center. Uh, I, think, um, uh, I think it's going to impact uh, the realities of Hong Kong. And therefore, I think that, uh, you know, people will want to move international uh, companies, etc., will also want to move out of Hong Kong. And they will be looking for other uh, places where they could set up their operations. So I don't think this is a positive thing for Hong Kong. Uh, but if that's what the Chinese want to do, then so be it. All right. Uh, so, Ambassador, we've run out of time, but in about 20 to 30 seconds, if you could just sum up for us uh, the kind of approach that India now needs to take with China at a time when India is trying to uh, flex its economic muscle in the region. We have this border dispute as well. How do we approach China, uh, Ambassador Bambavli? See, uh, Parikshit, India-China relations have always been very complex. And in a post-COVID world, they're getting even more complex. So I think we need to use every little bit of our uh, diplomacy, and we are capable of that, in ensuring that our uh, relations with China continue to stay on track, but at the same time, the interests, the national interests of India are met fully. It's a very difficult job, but Indian diplomacy is capable of it. Right. Ambassador Bambavli, thank you very much for joining us, putting that uh, crisis in perspective and also telling us how India should approach China in the weeks and months to come. Thank you for watching Global Eye.